Good evening, everyone. You can hear me okay? Great. Uh, I'm Phil Harling. I'm a history faculty member and the director of UM Center for the Humanities. Uh, It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you most heartily to the first Henry King Stanford Distinguished Professor's Lecture of the 2023-24 academic year. Uh, I'd like to start with a couple of very brief expressions of gratitude before we begin with the main event. Um, First of all, a special thanks to UM Libraries, to uh, to Dean Chuck Ekman and his excellent team for the use of this beautiful space, the uh, the Kislak Center. Um, Secondly, I'd love to thank and acknowledge uh, my wonderful staff at the Center for the Humanities who really kind of made this evening possible. And they are uh, Christina Larson, uh, Oni Dunham de Gonzalez, Vanessa Rodriguez Barcelos da Silva, and Lyric Johnson. Finally, uh, a special thanks to UM's brand new George P. Hanley Democracy Center and to its director, Greg Coger. And, uh, and George Hanley is with us here this evening. It's great to, great to see you here. Um, and Greg Coger, with whom we're partnering for tonight's talk, uh, this is a joint effort with the new Democracy Center. Greg is a uh, professor of political science here at UM, recently finished a stint as chair of the poli sci department. He's a specialist on legislative politics and political parties, uh, and the author, among many other things, of a book entitled Filibustering, A Political History of Obstruction in the House and the Senate. Now, I freely acknowledge uh, that you run a certain risk in calling up to the lectern to introduce our speaker, an academic who happens to be an expert in, of all things, filibustering. Uh, Still, uh, I trust Greg to be appropriately succinct and to the point in, uh, in making his introduction. So please take it away, Greg. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harling. I just want to talk for a couple hours about filibustering. <laughs> All right. Uh, but seriously, I did want to say just a few words about the Hanley Center. Uh, the uh, George P. Hanley... Uh, Direct Democracy Center is a new institution uh, on campus. It was formally opened in March 2023. Uh, and the central goals of the Hanley Center are to promote the understanding of democratic institutions and practices uh, and politics in the United States and, to, and abroad. Uh, towards this end, the Hanley Center sponsors faculty research, uh, conferences, student workshops, and public events like this one. Uh, we are especially grateful to the Center for Humanities, for the Humanities, for co-sponsoring tonight's speaker. Uh, and without further ado, uh, it is my honor to introduce our special guest and tonight's speaker, Ruth ben Uh Dr. ben Giet is Professor of History and Italian Studies at New York University. She writes about fascism, authoritarianism, uh, propaganda, and democracy protection. She is a recipient of Guggenheim and other fellowships, an advisor to protect democracy, and an MSNBC opinion columnist. Uh, she's the author or editor of several books, including Fascist Modernities and Italian Fascism's Empire Cinema, uh, which ex- uh, explores the appeal of strongmen to collaborators and followers, uh, and how fascist regimes use propaganda to construct an alter- alternate reality, and how culture anticipated the collapse of Mussolini's regime. Her latest book, Strongmen, Mussolini to the Present, Uh, examines how illiberal leaders use corruption, violence, propaganda, and machismo to stay in power, and how resistance to them has unfolded over a century. Uh, Because we live in an era when democracies are under siege from domestic and international forces seeking a transition to authoritarianism, Dr. ben Giet has worked to share her research experience with the general public. Uh, She appears frequently on TV and podcasts to discuss the threats to democracy, And she has a Substack account, providing short essays on modern authoritarianism. Uh, This evening's lecture distills this wisdom in an address entitled Strong Men and How to Push Back Against Them. Without further ado, Dr. Ben Giet, uh, I welcome you to our stage. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, introduction and... uh, I'm so glad to be here to speak to all of you, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Center for the Humanities and the Henry King Stanford Distinguished Professorship, 
Thank you to Phil Harling and Christina and Oni and Greg Kroger and Hugh Thomas and everybody who has collaborated in making my visit possible. I was also really pleased to hear that's co-sponsored by the George P. Hanley Democracy Center. And it's really good time to have a new center on that theme. So thank you, Mr. Hanley, for, for that. Um, let me just move this forward. Let's see. So there we go. That's my title. So we're living through historic times when the global clash between democracy and autocracy is coming to a head. 70% of the world's population is now governed by some variation of uh, some system of illiberal rule. And we, we hear about this all the time. And yet, there's another story that we don't hear about. We're witnessing the start of what I think is a seismic shift that is challenging authoritarian practices meant to turn us against each other, plunder the workforce, and destroy the planet. The shift is visible in the renaissance of mass nonviolent protest, the revival of, revival of labor actions, and the move away from fossil fuels. So the spoiler is that I'm optimistic. Um, those resisting around the world today know that strongmen leaders don't just endanger democracy, they pose an existential threat to humanity. The U.S. has become an important front of the global clash between tyranny and freedom. The transformation of the Republican Party into an autocratic leaning party places American democracy, society, and the environment in danger. The Republican Party, as it is today, negates the climate crisis, uh, has anti-science um, ideology built into its platforms, and one-third of sitting House Republicans are election deniers who will contest elections they don't win. Some of them don't. The end game of this, uh, as we've seen it work out in other countries, is that you no longer believe in the validity of elections as a way of deciding political transitions. This turn to autocracy is all the more tragic because authoritarianism is being revealed to be an unsustainable political system. Authoritarians are linked for profit motives to energy sources that accelerate the climate crisis. Think of Putin's kleptocracy, which is uh, based on you know, fossil fuels and oil and, and gas. They plunder businesses. We don't hear enough about the way that in Turkey and in Russia and many other places, business, private businesses are plundered. And they waste human and other capital by forcing millions of talented people into exile. Whether it's the 2023 earthquake in Turkey that exposed widespread fraud in the building industry, or Putin's 2022 ongoing war on Ukraine that laid bare the ravages of kleptocracy on the armed forces, millions are feeling firsthand the effects of callous and venal autocratic governments. Both Russia and Turkey are suffering brain drains and population losses as many flee abroad. If today's strongmen are becoming more repressive, it's also because they know they are slowly losing their hold over their people. Now, in the meantime, we need to understand how they got that hold over people in the first place. So, for a hundred years, and there are patterns in this, for a hundred years, charismatic leaders have found favor at times of uncertainty and transition when traditional parties and even political systems no longer seem to meet the needs of the moment. Often coming from outside political systems, uh, some strongmen were journalists, like Mussolini and Mobutu. They create new movements, and they communicate with their followers in original ways. Now, authoritarians also appeal when societies have made recent gains in, with gender, class, or racial equity. They soothe fears of the loss of male domination, elite privilege, and the end, if we're in the Euro-American context, the end of white Christian civilization. So it's when there's been a lot of uh, progress, social progress in society, often uh, that's when the backlash occurs and that this, the strong man becomes the vehicle of that backlash. In all of this, authoritarians get a big boost from conservative elites 
their most important promoters and collaborators. Afraid of losing their privileges, influential individuals bring the aspiring strongmen into the political system, thinking that they can control him. And that usually doesn't work out very well. They strike what is known in social science literature as an authoritarian bargain. The, they, they, sorry, they strike an authoritarian bargain with the leader. They get prosperity or a reversal of trends that are threatening to them in return for them being publicly loyal and tolerating violence and the suspension of rights. That's the authoritarian bargain. Now, one interesting thing, those who sign on, these elites, once they make their deal, they tend to stick with the leader no matter what happens. It's incredibly durable, these authoritarian bargains. Just one example I could choose from many. The Russian Orthodox Church has had an alliance with, with Putin and, and given his kleptocracy moral legitimacy. And in return, he's been funding the restoration of churches and many other things. So uh, this has continued uh, un unchanged, this alliance between the church and Putin, uh, throughout so far his genocidal war on Ukraine. Um, so no matter what happens, it's, it's rare unless things get very bad for these bargains to start to fray. So authoritarianism has evolved over a century. While one party states uh, and dictatorships still exist, Today's autocracy often preserve a veneer of freedom. And one name for this is electoral autocracy. You don't want to shut down elections. You keep them going, but you find ways to kind of weight the system so it's very difficult for the opposition to prevail. You domesticate the national media. You uh, purge the judiciary and the election apparatus of non-loyalists so that there's a challenge. It, does, it gets resolved in your favor. So you do all these things simultaneously and you, you find a way to stay in power without um, you know, becoming an old-fashioned dictator. And yet, so that's changed. And yet my research shows that the tools of rule that authoritarians use to manage themselves in power haven't really changed over a century. So I'm gonna take you on a tour of propaganda, um, machismo, corruption, and violence and then look at how you strike back uh, against strongmen. I'm doing that. There we go. So start with propaganda. And I have a quote for most of these tools of rule that kind of captures something about uh, the operation of that. Propaganda it has many definitions, but it's a set of communication strategies decide, designed to discourage critical thinking and persuade people that reality is what the leader says it is. Having a direct communications channel to cement the leader-follower bond is absolutely key. And so what's interesting is successful strongmen use the latest media technologies, whatever they are at that moment, extremely well. So Mussolini uh, was very skilled as kind of acting, let's say, in, in documentary films and newsreels. Uh, Hitler too, but Hitler used the radio because he had a very distinct uh, speaking voice. And in the 21st century, Modi is very skilled. You should check out his Instagram. And one of the personality cult canons is that the leader must be the man of the people, and this spans left and right wing. The man of the people, so if you go to his Instagram, he's very much the man of the people, but also the man above all other men. So here, he's using holograms in 2014 when he ran for office. So he's kind of you know, omniscient and godly, um, and that's part of what you want to go for if you are trying to build your leader cult. So they are very skilled at using whatever the, the communications vehicle is. So Trump had Twitter, uh, Bolsonaro also used Twitter. So whatever it is, they are um, they're very much men of their time. Say. But propaganda is also about, it's not just about getting people to believe lies. It's about changing the way people think and feel and the associations they make. So famously in Nazi Germany, if you heard the word Jew, you, would, you, were, you had been um, educated to think you know, all kinds of negative things. 
So that associations, uh, so it's really changing uh, the system of thought. That's very important. That's something that gets left out. People think, oh, propaganda, we're being taught to believe one lie or a set of lies. It's also changing the way you feel and think about the world, really. So propaganda might seem to be all about noise, but silence, what are we not hearing? Who's not speaking anymore? Is equally important. Strong men disappear people, but they disappear knowledge, too, that conflicts with their goals. In Chile, uh, dictator Augusto Pinochet, he closed down uh, philosophy and social science departments. He just, that they were gone. He said they were laboratories of Marxism. In Hungary, Prime Minister Viktor Orban banned gender studies. And authoritarians everywhere ban books and knowledge on LGBTQ themes and suppress climate change science. That's a universal today. In the US, legislation at the state level seeks to obscure the history of slavery and racial discrimination as well. So the noise, but also we have to think about the silence. Um, so machismo, Strong Men was the first book to take masculinity seriously and elevate it to a tool of rule and how it interacts with propaganda, with violence, with corruption. Because it's easy to not take these guys seriously um, and to laugh at these quotes, these bo- this kind of macho boasting. But it's deadly serious in some cases. And, and so I wanted to um, explore that. And it turns out it's extremely central to the operation of authoritarianism. So the gender politics of authoritarianism has three pillars to it. One is institutionalized misogyny. You've got to put women down. Two, you have to exalt a kind of hyper macho and brutal behavior, that model of manhood. So you're putting women down, you're puffing up a certain kind of man. Then third, you're suppressing other models of manhood and sexual identities. So there's the homophobia. And homophobia is the through line of authoritarianism. Um, There are even cases, for example, Gaddafi is the only uh, leftist in my book. And at the very beginning, he came to Libya through through a coup. At the very beginning, he did a ton for women. He took everybody's rights away eventually. But he gave them economic independence, he educated them, but he persecuted gays from day one. So homophobia. So those are the, that's the triad. Misogyny, um, hypermasculinity, and, and homophobia. So Mussolini was the first uh, ruler to start in the 1930s to use his body, his physical body, to equate strong leadership with macho aggression. And it caused a sensation. He was, all, he was an international media star. And here he is um, kind of you know, doing the ancient peasant thing of threshing wheat. But he's got these cool goggles on. And so he stands for the reconciliation of tradition and modernity. And, and he never missed an opportunity to sometimes to strip his shirt off on camera. Or he would go skiing in the winter with no shirt on. Um, this was a big part of his uh, persona actually. And this, co- this correlates to the defender of the nation, uh, the, the masculine, muscled body stands for all of that. Almost 100 years later, Putin picked this up. And really, in between, there isn't anybody, you know, Mao allowed himself to be, uh, you know, uh, photographed when he was swimming, but you just saw the top of his body. But there isn't really anyone who uh, did as much um, half-naked Uh, presentations of themselves between Mussolini and Putin. If you know of someone, please, I'd love to hear about it. But so there's there's lots of series of of Putin with no shirt on. Now Trump, he tried to join in. (laughs) I know, it's terrible. But he had to borrow Sylvester Stallone's body in Rocky III. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, and we can laugh at it, if this was just one, uh, a Trump fan, I wouldn't be showing it to you. The reason I'm showing you this is that it's an official personality cult product because it comes directly from, it's not a retweet, 
it comes directly from his personal account, which is what he mostly used. So somebody, either him or someone in his entourage, thought this was a good idea and did this. And that's why uh, we're, we're, I'm showing it to you. So the appeal of these leaders lies in their perceived ability to get away with things that ordinary men cannot. That's very important. The essence of authoritarianism is getting away with stuff. So they are the men who can get away with things. So they're not including violence and corruption. So they're not just everywhere, like Modi with the hologram. They're also omnipotent and they're untouchable, including by the law, in theory. So this, is, this lawlessness, this rogue uh, image is very important for the, the classic strongman. So that's a good segue to corruption. This is a long quote, but it's, uh, like all dictatorships is the key, what, what it makes people do. And this is an excellent book on Pinochet's Chile. So corruption is a process. It depends on changes in professional ethics and moral codes. It's about getting people to accept things that were previously considered to be immoral or uh, unthinkable and doing things that you thought you would never do. So strong men specialize in bringing the unthinkable into being. Now, at their worst, like a Hitler, so they're innovators in violence. They're innovators in mass deception. So they create um, states of reality that people didn't expect uh, would ever happen. And here we can put in, we can plug in the it can't happen here thing, right? So already we, you know, you could see that a Hitler created a certain horrible reality and that was a surprise. But then you could say, well, that would never happen here. So strongmen specialized in innovation uh, of the worst possible things. And, and this is equally important, getting people, their elite collaborators often, and also the foot soldiers, getting people to do things they never imagined they would do. That's, that's the, the tragedy. And there's three, three parts. And convincing them that they will get away with it too as long as they stay loyal to the leader. And this is a big deal in actual authoritarian regimes, but not always. It's also can, this, this kind of psychological, moral process uh, can, can be operative in a democracy if you have an authoritarian uh, type of president. So, if we take a, an example of someone recent, all these mugshots, and Mark Meadows, of course, was uh, Trump's um, the chief of staff. He was the glue. Every coup, a third of my book is about coups, every coup has a fixer or a person who's the glue and connects everybody and also has privileged access to the, the people who are trying to do the coup. Um, and that was Mark Meadows. And so they, they live in a kind of charmed circle where they become, they come to think that they are going to be also untouchable by the law. So what's in his face is anger here. But also there's a kind of incredulity that, and it's not just him, some of the other people, they can't believe this is happening to them. Um, this wasn't supposed to happen. So this, I'm showing you this because these processes don't have to only happen in, in, a, in, a, in a, what we would consider an authoritarian state. Now, most politicians under investigation or having indictments over their heads, they don't want to run for office. It's not a good idea. <laughs> like, investigative journalists can start probing into you or opposition research, but strong men are not most politicians. They have to run for office, they feel, because they need to get to power or get back into power to, make their, to have the power to make their legal troubles go away forever. So there's a long list of uh, strongmen who have run for office uh, with criminal record, like Mussolini and Hitler, or under investigation or having indictments, uh, just some contemporary ones, Putin, Trump, uh, Netanyahu, and um, Silvio Berlusconi, all were in that situation. So, and then once they're in power, once these situations are set up, 
they know that making the government a refuge for criminals who don't have to be learn, learn to be lawless, they're already lawless, is how you hasten the corruption process. And corruption experts sometimes use the word contagion. And this is why they pardon people. Um, many authoritarians pardon people because that indebts people to them, but it also gets people who already have skills at fraud or whatever into government service. It sounds terribly cynical, but, but there's a long list of Pinochet pardoned and Mussolini pardoned. You, you do that and then you get those people with the skills that you need. And unfortunately, we are living through a version of this uh, with the Republican Party, which is at a very particular um, moment in its history. And when a party is changing its political culture, you watch who's, being, who's leaving and who's coming in. And so after January 6th especially, you have people who stand up for the rule of law, like Liz Cheney, <coughs> even very conservative people, but there's certain things, are leaving. The latest is Mitt Romney. They're, they don't feel there's a space for them. Then we see who's coming in or who has been supported to run for office. What are the values? These are just a general thing to think about. What are the values that the party wants in its representatives today? So uh, we have uh, conspiracy theorist Vivek Ramaswamy, who we have a serial fraudster, George Santos. These are the newer people coming in. And we also have a whole bunch of extremists who are being normalized. We have Oath Keepers, we have Proud Boys, these are you know, violent anti-government extremists um, who are being normalized and put into positions of power. So now this, this suggests you could say, well, the, most of the Republicans are not like that. But we have to watch uh, the kind of renewal of cadres, as it used to be called in communism, when the party is remaking itself. You, you need corrupt people if you are going to sustain autocratic rule and deny elections and use threat. You can't have the regular people who like a Liz Cheney. Um, you need others. Okay. That's an interesting quote by Putin. Note the date. It was when he first started. Uh, he was just newly um, in office. So for 100 years, strongmen and their enablers have led the societies they govern to see harming others as justifiable and even patriotic. So you have to shift the perception of violence. And here's where violence connects with propaganda. And one path to this is getting people to feel that they are existentially threatened by a group and convincing them that the only way to solve problems in society is through violence or threat. And, and violence is on a huge continuum, right? So one thing that is very active, not only in America, but uh, in all far-right uh, parties and governments today, great replacement theory. That's our name for it here. The idea that uh, people of color are having too many babies, and so they're going to kind of extinguish the whites. The, this is the fear of the demise of white civilization. Tucker Carlson featured Great Replacement Theory 400 times on his show. 400 times. The New York Times did a superb data-driven investigation on this. Um, so this is where propaganda. So every time it's the, the panic, the moral panic, the fear, uh, you need that kind of thing to shift um, a collective, to make a collective climate to get people to break their taboo and say, you know what, I might have to be okay if my neighbor is harmed, right? So in Italy, the neo-fascist prime minister, uh, Giorgia Meloni, has her own term for this. Uh, she calls it ethnic substitution, which evokes kind of ethnic cleansing of white people. But, and her version is that um, she's, she's to the right of Tucker Carlson. She's like way out there. She thinks there's a plot by the usual suspects, George Soros and the EU, to flood Italy with non-white immigrants, and so whites will gradually become extinct. So that's the ethnic substitution. So these are very, very convincing to people as uh, levers of fear. So I'm just pointing out that there's other pathways into this, but this is one that everyone knows about. 
Last point on this is violence also has to be touted as the only way to move history forward. And both communists and fascists with very different frameworks believed that struggle was the way that history would, would move forward, that was a motor of progress. And what are coups? Um, coups are you know, strikes at the state. They are a total repudiation of change through any kind of reformist means. You have to use violence rather than elections to have a political tradition. So knowing this, we have to listen carefully to what is being said by politicians. Uh, it could be in India, it could be in our country. So Representative Matt Gates, he went to the state fair uh, to be with Trump in August. And he has people were there with their kids eating corn dogs. And what does he say? Quote, only through force do we make any change to a corrupt town like Washington? So I'm looking at this from the eyes of authoritarian rhetoric. Okay, only through force. So we're not going to use elections. We're not going to use democratic reform. We're going to use violence. That's the only way we can have change. That's what he's saying. So this is the language of coups. And again, who is talking this way to try and shift the climate to get people to think that violence is an acceptable way of doing politics. So that's something you want to watch. Okay. The violence the strongman unleashes is also his reaction to fear. Fear is why strongmen use blackmail to tie people to them, why they throw on that cloak of masculine invincibility, why they build those palaces and those bunkers to hide in when things go bad. The authoritarian playbook has no chapter on failure, and every leader who declines due to his own bad decisions is surprised at his fate and blames everyone but himself. And Putin's war is an example of what I call autocratic backfire. Um, so this is Lukashenko who Protesters were coming toward his palace, and he put on a bulletproof vest, uh, grabbed a rifle, and went up in a helicopter and, and just was in a panic mode. So it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, example of that. So just to, to look at this, because it's ongoing with Putin, um, Putin had become more vulnerable in the last years. The pandemic had weakened the Russian economy. And a 2021 poll by Levada, which is a respected in, uh, independent pollster, showed that almost half of Russians aged 18 to 24 felt the country were going, was going in the wrong direction. And this is when, when strongmen feel threatened or when they fall ill, for example, they can act rashly they, to secure their th authority and their place in history. So there's a lot of political science studies on this. They start wars, or if they're in a war that's not going well, instead of doing the rational thing and getting out of the war, they double down. And there's a phrase for this in political science, gambling for resurrection. You do the big thing, the risky thing, and most of them lose the wager. So knowing these patterns, and having written about this, especially with Mussolini, who did the gamble and lost. The minute I heard that Putin went into Ukraine, I was like, hmm, this isn't going to go well. So this is an op-ed I did for MSNBC, and it was published like just several days after the invasion started, predicting, unfortunately uh, for, for Putin, all of it's come true, predicting that it would expose you know, the ravages of corruption and the military, all this stuff, because that's 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 the situations that these people get them into, themselves into. And indeed, one of the, um, it was like a curtain has been drawn back on the dysfunctions of, of autocracy through this war. The supposedly unbeatable Russian military, um, you know, US and foreign uh, military and intelligence experts were shocked at the incompetence um, at the you know terrible like supplies, the, the rancid rations, the ancient weapons, um, all of this reminds me of, of what the Italians went through in World War II. And this, so they've sustained devastating losses. Think of all the generals who lost their lives in the first uh, months. This was all shocking to people. And hundreds of thousands uh, of men have fled Russia to escape conscription. 
and then elites are turning against him. And the Atlantic published an article called Southern, Sudden Russian Death Syndrome because so many elites, we're up to like three dozen elites have met uh, with you know, death and sus suspicious circumstances falling out of windows because they're criticizing the war. I mean, the scale of this, and many of them are connected to the energy sector because that's the anchor of the kleptocracy. And then that, all of that was before Prigozhin staged a mutiny that left Putin uh, even more uh, weakened. But this war is also, I'm transitioning to the, the, the hopeful part, this war has also given us a primer of the ways you can strike back at autocrats, where they most um, resent it, and that's going after their money. So sanctions have given us a primer on how to do this. The war has also prompted many countries to have a reckoning with their dependence on Russian fossil fuels. And remember, so Russia is a kleptocracy, and we don't we should always say that when we mention Russia. And um, oil and gas are its fuel. So uh, lessening dependence on those fuels is a strike at, at Putin's income. So to conclude this part, strong men like Putin are doubling down now because they know their time is limited and their scams are being revealed. They are rapaciously clinging to power, trying to exploit everything because they are the old paradigm of leadership and they must do their best to block a new one from emerging. But they will not succeed, and here is why. It's a great quote. Everywhere we look, we see evidence of a new will to stand up for freedoms and rights and push back against oppression. We're actually living through an incredible wave globally of nonviolent protest and it has not been reported on or analyzed as a systemic global reaction to authoritarianism, but that's what it is. I mean, look at this is incredible what's gone on in one of the most repressive regimes of the world in the world. So 2019 was a world record for protests. Since then, or from that date, Chile, Belarus, Iran, China, Israel, Venezuela, Serbia, and I could add others, have all experienced either the biggest demonstrations they've had in decades or ever. Even just in China, and we're not hearing about this uh, after the November 2022 20, lockdown protest because the Chinese don't, don't want it to be talked about, 79 universities had protests against this dehumanizing lockdowns, including Xi Jinping's alma mater, which is a, an elite incubator. 79 universities, that's a lot. So now, there are different circumstances in each place, but something is happening. So this part of, this part of the lecture is about things that are happening on the horizon that have to do with um, authoritarianism. So the U.S. is also on this trajectory. The 2017 Women's March was the largest protest in American history. And it had a double impact because what you want, protest alone can't, um, it does a lot, but when it feeds into an electoral strategy, that's when it's golden. And that's what happened. Thousands of women who participated in the Women's March ended up running for office in 2018 or later. So that was surpassed only by the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020. Up to 20 million people in the middle of the pandemic engaged in a Black Lives Matter event and created momentum to defeat Trump in the presidential election. So after this, too, there's a new wave of anti-authoritarian action gaining momentum on the streets, in local courts, in state houses, around the country. And there's been, uh, some of this builds on uh, America's civil rights tradition since the civil rights movement was a local movement, right, as well as national. And so this, is, uh, this got a lot of attention and it felt like the future to me. Um, when uh, these two uh, representatives were expelled from the Tennessee House of uh, Representatives because they joined protest, 
in favor of gun safety legislation. And so they, uh, Justin Pearson said, I come from a long line of people who have resisted. So there's, we have global anti-authoritarian practice to feed us, but we also have civil rights and other traditions, suffragette traditions. We have all kinds of protest traditions. In their mania to, to control bodies, votes, and minds, Republicans are actually sparking a vast rejection of their inhumanity, and new alliances are forming between grassroots groups and Democratic lawmakers at the state level. So here's a, here's a um, quote by Florida Democratic Chair Nikki Freed. She was arrested in April, along with state Sen Senate Minority Leader Lauren Book, for having protested Governor DeSantis' abortion restrictions. She said, you are seeing the nation just sort of burst at its seams with political tension. Now, mass nonviolent protest, accent on nonviolent, is one of the most effective ways to deal with such tension especially when grassroots organizers can link up with what people call the pillars of society. These are influential people from politics, from business, from other sectors who maybe wouldn't be out there in the streets, but when you have alliances that come into being, this is why in Israel the protests have lasted hundreds of thousands of people for so long because you've got you know, CEOs of tech companies, you've got the former, you know, heads of uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, you've got all these elites who are there with the grassroots people. So, so there are interesting alliances that are happening um, now. Now, by bringing many types of people together, mass protests enact another of anti-authoritarian tool, bridge building. I know that's something that the Hanley uh, Center is uh, in, interested in, you know, being depolarizing, reaching across divides created by disinformation and hatred to find some common ground and establish a dialogue. Or keep relations going with radicalized loved ones or acquaintances. So many of us have some person in their lives or their workplace who is what I call they're in the disinformation tunnel and it's very difficult to get through to these people. My own mother, uh, who lives in England in a small village, she was radicalized during the pandemic, during the lockdown. She started uh, watching Russia Today, the Kremlin propaganda channel, and she got completely, her whole world was shifted, and she, be, she never mentioned Putin. She became a fan of Putin. It was, a, it was a very serious thing, and I was not able to get through to her for a very, very long time. So we don't hear enough about the entire, there's a whole world of networks and organizations that are working to depolarize Americans by creating points of contact among people of opposing political beliefs and also, and this is very important, build confidence that dialogue can occur. Because when you reach a, a, a state of extreme polarization, you lose faith and trust that you can have a conversation. Or it's, or it's dangerous, right? Or you fear having it. So there are lots of initiatives going on. Some of them operate at a local level. There's the organization Braver Angels that facilitates communications and conversations in towns and cities. Others are creating national coalitions. There's one called Bridging Divides, and they bring pro progressive and conservative groups together. So they're working at a more collective level. And others harness the healing power of faith, and I think we can do much more to involve our faith leaders of many traditions uh, in, the, in building a pro-democracy movement. And I'm a big fan of Reverend uh, William Barber and his Repairers of the Breach organization. And finally, others work internationally, like the East-West Center, um, and then there's the group More in Common, and many of, and it works internationally and in the U.S., and many of its uh, employees trained in conflict zones around the world, and now they're applying those things here. So there's a whole, there's a whole world of stuff going on, and we just don't really hear about it. Um, so this is hard work. And to do it effectively, we also have to accept some hard truths, starting with the fact that in its present forms, democracy has proved unfulfilling to people. 
And so this is part of the reason people are going for authoritarianism. They're not finding what they need or want in democracies. So there was a survey done by Afrobarometer of 34 African countries, and it found, it's a very large survey, found that those aged 18 to 25 were less likely than their elders to consider democracy their preferred form of government. And there's a similar one of Latino barometer, which, which so this is a global problem. So everywhere, democracies have generated loneliness, economic inequality, and disaffection with politics. And there's a very good book that influenced me a lot by an economist, Norina Hertz, called The Lonely Century. It's a great book, The Lonely Century. And all of this disaffection and atomization, charismatic demagogues know how to exploit that. And what do they say? They say, come, I have a community. I have a tribe. You can belong. So this is part of the problem. Um, so that's why it's not enough for us to turn back autocracy where we see it forming. To make democracy uh, appealing for future generations, we have to reform it. We have to make it the political expression of the values of social justice, equity, inclusivity. So we have to reassess democratic institutions and practices in terms of the values they are actually perpetuating. Who's benefiting from them and who is excluded? We also need to broaden our knowledge base out from what my friend, the British economist, Diane Coyle, calls the self-elected priesthoods. In the past, often white males. Who gets to be an authority? Who is listened to? Whose expertise is valued in a society? And we find that bringing the perspectives of marginalized groups to the center renews our thinking about resources, about rights, about power. Think about concepts of land. That's, that's very, all over the world without indigenous people's perspectives is very difficult to think about land and land use. Um, so I'm tracking the initiatives and experiments going on around the world of people who are trying to revitalize democracy in this way and enshrine these values uh, into institutions and laws. So one interesting example, it's, it's a largely failed example, but that doesn't matter to me. Uh, the new constitution that the progressive government in Chile uh, presented to Chileans, they were trying to rewrite the constitution. They still had the constitution from Pinochet's dictatorship. It had been revised, but it was still that. So it's a progressive government by a 36-year-old uh, president. He wanted to redo it. So they created one that um, it mandated gender parity in government. It required the, the government to intervene on climate change effects. It addressed economic inequality. It defined Chile as a plurinational country to recognize the 11% of the population that's indigenous. It provided rights to animals. It provided rights to nature. So it was a totally visionary document. And like many new and visionary things, it was hated. <laughs> People didn't want to accept it, and 62% of Chilean voters rejected it. And now um, the center-right uh, has the majority uh, on the commission that's redrafting it. So this visionary document is not going to see the light of day. Um, however, I wanted to tell you about it because I do see it as a blueprint in its ambitions for an anti-authoritarian constitutional and legal order. It's a very interesting experiment. So to bring this new order into being and to be able to support these experiments, policy and mass mobilization are not enough. We have to believe in our hearts that another reality is possible and that we are precious beings who deserve good governance and not strife and death. So here's where hope and optimism come in. Far from being foolish idealism, they are actually preconditions of resistance. It's the ability, and, and people who are uh, dissidents in, in real authoritarian states, they, they're very clear about the importance of hope as the ability to have a vision of what the country could be. 
That's why people you might think would be not hopeful at all are actually very, they stress when I interview them or talk to them the importance of hope. One of them is Ai Jin Pu, who's executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. So she sees exploitation every day. She advocates for the most vulnerable domestic workers. She told me, hope is the most underrated and most valuable ingredient to a functioning democracy. And there are also a lot of climate change scientists, climate scientists, who you would not expect uh, to be uh, hopeful. But Catherine Hayhoe of the Nature Conservancy, uh, she said she's been, she now has renewed hope because that collective behavior has actually changed much faster than climate scientists thought in terms of changing behaviors that will mitigate uh, the climate crisis. The future is in our hands. We can make a difference, she concludes. So to get to my own conclusion, showing these. While social science and literature can never quite come to uh, a decision on how much leaders matter in a country, in terms of productivity, prosperity. The study of strong men makes it very clear how lethal leaders who use power for selfish ends are to a country. As I conclude in strong men, authoritarians are at their worst when their people need them the most. Think of Hitler just like going into his bunk bunker and abandoning Germans. And when they need them the most is often when the people are dealing with a crisis that the authoritarian in part caused by his own policies. Leaders also matter at the national and state level, at the town council level, and we sorely need to give effective democratic leaders from the bottom up the star treatment that's now lavished on these strong men. We need an upgrade and an updating of our conceptions of power there's still this retrograde ideal of brute male force as being, that's what gets the headlines. It's, it's seen as glamorous and entertaining even, despite its disruptive outcomes. So just as a rhetorical question, how come this way of being a leader and relaxing is seen as acceptable and this way of being a leader and relaxing caused a scandal. Okay. So Putin made a, a macho statement during the really large protests against him in 2019. He decided to hang out with his biker gang. He's in a biker gang, and they're all like thugs, and those are his friends. But The Finnish Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, who's very, she's no longer Prime Minister, but she's in her 30s, very young, and she had just finished the accession talks of Finland for NATO. That's kind of a big deal. And so she went out clubbing with friends, and it was a giant international scandal. So how come this is okay, but this isn't okay? So we have to develop models of power that see care, collaboration, and compassion, and fun as strengths and not weaknesses, and support those who are charting new paths and breaking with tired conventions, and reimagining power in ways that challenge the strongman model. And finally, authoritarianism is meant to be exhausting. All the lies, all the threats, all the spectacles, and it can be difficult and discouraging to show up day after day to protest or register people to vote, doing all this stuff without knowing what the outcome will be. But history tells us that dictators and repressive political systems have been defeated, including by the cumulative effects of such actions taken by people who believe they will make a difference. The age of the strongman may still be with us, but a new anti-authoritarian order is on the horizon, including here at home.